Father, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been sent to become infused into us. And Jesus, you have waited for that moment when you paid the price for humanity and you sent the promise of the Holy Spirit. To the early church and to the first recipients, they thought that the Holy Spirit was just to come to empower them to be a witness. But through time, we see we move from the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 to Revelation chapter 22, where we see that the Spirit is not just to empower us, but the Spirit is to fill us, infuse us, until we and the Holy Spirit cannot be distinguished until we become filled with the Holy Spirit and become the personification of the Holy Spirit. Until we become fully the reflection of our Lord Jesus Christ to show forth all His glory so that when they look at us, they will see Jesus in all His fullness. Then you have the form of the Father, the form of the Son and the Word, the form of the Holy Spirit, of, of which we are part of that dimension and image. We thank you for the high calling of God. We thank you, Father, for this divine calling. We become New Jerusalem, and we flow into that fullness of it. Thank you, Father. Give you glory, give you worship, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. We are all done? Online? Okay. Um, many people are excited about this move in what God is going to do, the amount of signs and the amount of wonders. Uh, remember that signs and wonders are but a side effect of that which God does. And um, it is just like um, imagine that God's presence is there. I know God's presence is in heaven, but we're talking about God's presence manifesting on the earth. And the reason why there are signs and wonders is because we are carriers of the presence of God on the earth. At the center is God. And um, then you have the world. And it's because of this uh, presence of God that continues to increase in our midst. And uh, that presence continues to flow. And it goes back all the way to New Jerusalem. And here we are, allowing the presence of God to flow through us. And when the presence of God flows through us, remember that the side effect of God's presence is where the miracles take place. Remember how I always say, and the presence of the Lord was present to heal them. And the day is coming when Revelation chapter 22, the glory of God was in New Jerusalem. And we read in uh, Revelation chapter 22, it tells us here, this is New Jerusalem, and this is what's inside New Jerusalem. There was a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, 
and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now that looks like something in the future is a new heaven, new earth. But there are certain parts that says in verse 2, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's no need of healing in new heaven, new earth. So something of those 12, tree, uh, 12 fruit comes into this part of heaven, this part of earth, and this dispensation, and cause healing of the nations. You can say in a way, New Jerusalem glory comes into the thickness of it. And uh, then, it's, there is no light. The only light that is needed there is the Lamb. The Lamb's light shine, and the Father's, of, of course, is also there. And you notice that it says here, and um, this uh, particular verse, it was 14. Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, may enter through the gates into the city. Outside are all these things. Outside refers to this present earth, outside. And so these blessings are there, that the Lord promised. Verse 17, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, let him who thirst come, whoever drinks, desires, let him take the water of life freely. Do you notice the water of life that comes from New Jerusalem is available in this time? So there is a connection. And let's assume that's a connection to New Jerusalem. New heaven, new earth. And New Jerusalem is there. There is a connection that as we increase in worship and prayer, as praise and worship continue to increase, and uh, we are people of praise. So let me put this color down. As we continue to increase praise and worship, we increase in praise and worship. 24 hour worship and then on the planet Earth, there are pockets and places where we increase praise and worship. Praise and worship to increase to such a degree that when it reaches a certain point at times, you will have New Jerusalem glory manifest inside. And each time it manifests, that's where you see tremendous signs and wonders because of the present. And that's what God wants to do. That's what part of the vision of Ezekiel when he saw the river increasing and increasing. That river is tied to the temple. And that temple somehow is the manifestation in this time of New Jerusalem to the best of our ability. And it's part of the white building concept that connect the two. So just now when we're worshipping, I saw that when we begin to increase in 24-hour worship, there will be times when New Jerusalem glory will come. It is always there, latent power. And then there will be times, even the fullness of God's presence in this universe is already powerful. But even more, as we become worshippers of God, and 24-hour worship becomes part of our DNA, then the worship will be so strong, it's just that we, we, we create a cloud. The cloud that is necessary for New Jerusalem glory to come forth. We are not just creating praise and worship to contain the presence of God coming down from heaven. That is like secondary for us. But we are creating a greater worship in the spirit and in truth so great that New Jerusalem glory can manifest. What 
is the powers of the age to come. What belong is already predicted in the Bible. There will be times when the powers of the age to come. And it's written in Hebrew, so it's not talking about long ago. Because the Old Testament and generation before look at us as the age to come. But Hebrews chapter 6 is written in the New Testament. And it's written of the age to come, which is new heaven, new earth. That there will be a time when powers of the age to come manifest. When it manifests, that is when if people turn away from that, they immediately are lost. Because of the degree of God's presence. And it's, it's good, at the same time dangerous. And uh, that is going to happen. And that's why we need a level of persistence. We are in prevailing prayer. We need also prevailing prayer with prevailing praise and worship. So to be able to prevail in prayer, you must prevail in praise and worship. From point A to point B, prevailing prayer holds on to that which you see that is to come. Remember I talked about the future changing the past. You enter into a place where you see as done, completed, and you're in a timeless zone. And you just walk from point A to point B. Which I want to emphasize tonight is learning the secret of patience or hupomone. It is easier than say. The principle is simple, but acquiring it takes time. So on the show, uh, two, if not three people, who have to learn about patience. First person is Moses. Now Moses already had encountered God. Moses, if you already remember, God made him wait for 40 years. He was 40 years too early. So by the time he is the age of 80, 40 years was his natural life, 40 years in the wilderness, and now he's 80 years old. God appeared to him, gave him three signs in Exodus. He saw the burning bush, he encountered the angel of God, and the first sign was a stick changing the snake. Second sign was a leprous hand. Third sign was the sign of water turned into blood. God gave him three signs. And with these signs, the Lord says, this is a 400-year-old promise that God promised Abraham. He will not forget his people. God says he remembered his covenant. And God says now is the time to take them out of Egypt. The time when they went into Egypt was special. It was through Joseph. Now taking them out of Egypt was through another man of God, Moses. It was also a special time. So God sent Moses, and then Moses said, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, in verse 13, chapter 3, verse 13, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. They say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? That's when God revealed his new name, Yahweh. And God said to Moses, now you find the name Yahweh in the Old Testament, in Genesis also, because it's Moses who wrote the book of Genesis. So he brought it backwards. At that time when they encountered Yahweh, they didn't know it was Yahweh. They only know him as El Elyon, or Most High God, or El Shaddai, like in Abraham. And God says to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, I'm Yahweh. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Yahweh has sent me to you. And then he told them about the God visiting them, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and what the Lord will do to them, and how he will do all these things. So they were quite a detailed thing. Remember, even this is a summary. God spoke a lot of things to Moses. Uh, he had quite an encounter. Then Moses said in chapter 4, suppose they don't believe me. That's when God gave him the sign. See, if I just tell them, they won't believe me. 
So God says, okay, what's in your hand? A rod. So he gave him the sign of the rod. And then he says, uh, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. Then he says, if they don't believe this, in verse 6, the Lord says, put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, took it out, and his hand changed, the sign of the leprous hand. And so he said, if they don't believe the first sign, it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. And it shall be, if they don't believe these two signs, go one more. You can take water from the river, pour it on dry land, and the water will turn to blood. So God gave him the third sign, which he did not do, but God says he will do. If they need a third sign, three signs, God gave to him. In the end, after a little bit of uh, hesitation, Moses agreed to go. And by the time he left, it was like you know, nearly, uh, nearly a year or so. And here's his first encounter with Pharaoh. And in chapter 5, he encountered and says, Thus says the God of Israel, let my people go. Now before he encountered Pharaoh, he would encounter his people. And Pharaoh says, in verse to who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert. And then the king of Egypt says, Moses, Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? And then he says, you're idle. And instead of making life easy for the people of Israel, things went the opposite way. Can you imagine with signs and wonders, things went the opposite way? He would have thought with these signs and wonders and this power that Pharaoh would yield. But he says, your idol, your idol, he says. And then he says, I will make your work harder. This time I will provide you the materials for, for bricks. You could look for the materials, make the bricks, and the quota must still be the same. So it's going to be twice the work. So, when it took place, in verse 22, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you trouble, brought trouble on these people? Why did you send me? Since I came to speak in your name, he has only done evil to these people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. So the same. When this move first started, many people think that it would be easy going. And they thought, like Moses, that he will, you know, immediately, because it's such a unique message, and all they immediately respond. And instead, we see the goodness of God for those who believe, but those who have believed, those who quarterly believe, those who hesitate, instead, all they see is more persecution, more misunderstanding, and more things, quote unquote, more evil more trial because they do not know the way of the Lord like Moses everyone is a, an amateur in this move because we have never had such a move before and what we need and Moses need was patience but patience does not come overnight. Even if you are a very experienced man, Moses is 80 years old. I would consider him a very patient man. In the wilderness for 40 years. But yet, the first requirement of patience is, there are three different lessons of patience. Because, the Lord does not reveal everything. When He starts, He always reveals a little bit at a time, enough for us to obey Him. Moses has to learn to work with the Lord's timing and the Lord's methodology. 
because he thought it was immediate. But who knows? There needed to be 10 more plagues. But the Lord never talked to him about that. Moses didn't know there's going to be these 10 plagues. And instead, Pharaoh keeps getting harder and harder and harder. But the harder Pharaoh got, the greater God's glory was shown. You can see that when Moses say words like in verse 22, he expected it to be very easy. After all, there are these signs and wonders. And uh, then God says, go again this time. And remember, they, he was only to do the signs to the Israelites. But now God let him do the signs in front of Pharaoh. See, the signs were made for the people of God so that they can respond. But now, it's going to be used against Pharaoh. And that was when, after uh, this uh, little genealogy that is there, and Aaron represents his spokesman, and that's when God permitted him to do signs to Egypt. That was when they began to learn to trust God. Now God never revealed any, everything. God revealed only one step at a time. So Moses, I want to show, needs to learn patience because he was learning God's methods and timing. So there's a first feel of patience. God doesn't always work the way we think He will work. When this move first started, people think it will go the way of normal churches. People think it will go the way of normal growth or normal uh, things, the way we're organizing. No. But God has His ways of doing things. In fact, when we were sent all over the world building altars, say, hey, that's quite a lot of strange things to do. But the Lord knows what He's doing. We only take things one step at a time. So Moses did not know everything, but he learned one thing after this. He never said those words he said to God, Why do you trouble us? When he said that, he was an immature. I want to show you that everyone starts as an immature in the things of God before they turn professional in the things of God. As God began to do one sign after the other, Moses began to gain confidence. And so one challenge come, one challenge, you never hear Moses complain again. In fact, it's Pharaoh who keep going against God. But by the time you reach Exodus, after many, many plagues, by the time you reach Exodus chapter 14, because remember, when they do the, turn the stick, the snake, the magicians also did the same thing. The only thing is Moses' snake eat up all their snakes. And that shows some power. But Moses, uh, when Moses did that, and the magicians of Egypt did that, it was 22, Pharaoh's heart grew hard. But Moses now never complained. <coughs> Moses now was prepared to take the long haul. He's now prepared, he's mentally now prepared to go the long haul. See what happened in this move is a lot of people are impatient. They want a shortcut. They're always looking for a shortcut. And God has always got his timing. But they're always looking for shortcuts to fast track everything. And so Part of it is the impatience of people and not learning patience. By the time you reach Exodus chapter 14, chapter 14, there they are, they cross a, they are about to cross the Red Sea. And look at the confidence of Moses now. Moses has seen one mountain after the other removed. Then in verse 13, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. 
The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. Up to verse 14, Moses did not know what the Lord was going to do. But the Moses you see here is a different Moses you saw earlier. Within that short time of his encounter with Pharaoh, he now has full confidence in the Lord. He does not know what the next step, but he just knew one thing. The Lord is there, it will all work out. He even talked to the people and said, God will show, show himself up. God will do something. And then he began to pray. And the word cry is like, is a very loud cry to the Lord. Like a prayer call. Can you see that? A call for help. So Moses began to spend time in prayer. And he was confident in God now. He knew that just praying and praying, God will, God will answer. They just have to be patient and wait. No matter how long. He had learned patience. And that patience had grown now. Then the Lord says in verse 15, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it. And a miracle happened that up to that day has never happened on the planet Earth. Moses was the first one to part the waters. After that, in many anointing, you find it in Joshua, you find it in Elijah, you find it in Elisha. But Moses parted the whole sea. See, when God does a miracle, He can do it over and over and over again. So as He stretched out His rod, God began to do a sign and wonder. You learn from Moses. Even Moses has to learn patience. He has to learn patience. Later on, when um, in the wilderness for very long, which was a 40-year wilderness, they were supposed to be one year, but they were delayed because of the disobedience of the Israelites. During that 40 years, you have a record of him also losing patience with the people. But that's one in 40 years. But it was a critical time. Um, but more or less, Moses grew in patience as he learned to walk with God. Let me show you another one. The key is to learn this resting, quiet patience. When you have this patience as you're developing God, you will have the ability to go from point A to point B without even losing one hair. And so, the next person we see is David. David, young David, he was anointed to be king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. He was roughly around 17 years old. The Bible never said that, but it's around roughly about that age. So, in the end, when he was anointed, remember, to be king. When he's anointed to be king, he says in verse 13, the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, this is the one. So in the end, they found David. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Do you notice his brothers all knew he was anointed? But David still continued to take care of the sheep because no one know how that was going to happen. But you remember in the next chapter, his elder brother, he got a few brothers who were there fighting the war. His elder brother disliked David. When David was going around asking questions about what would be done to anyone who slay Goliath, at first, his brothers are there. He got more than one brother. He say he went there. He actually went there to bring food for his brothers. 
and with a little present for the captain there from his father. And uh, so he greeted his brothers, gave them the food and everything, and then instead of going home, he started asking about what shall be done in verse 26 to the man who kills a Philistine. And Eliab, his oldest brother, heard. And Eliab was angry at David and said, Why did you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Now here's a strange thing. They know he was anointed to be king. And here he is behaving like a king. Because partly he does anointing. But they still treat him like he got no anointing. Correct? The elder brother, this is the youngest brother, don't forget, David is the youngest among them. He treat David like, like as if David was never anointed in the first place. He had a jealousy. He had a natural relationship with David. And remember, these are a lot of brothers, so the age difference is quite a lot. The elders are one among them, Eliab. And remember when, when Samuel looked at the sons, even he thought Eliab was the one. Because outward he must be very good looking, strong and tall. But God says man looks outside, God looks at the heart. There was something in Eliab's heart that God saw. Was David had a different heart. Remember God was looking for a man after his own heart. So there was something in Elias' heart. He doesn't learn about the anointing. He doesn't realize how powerful the anointing is. Put it this way. If God tonight anoint you to be someone who can win one billion people to Jesus, people might not recognize the anointing. But let me tell you, you'll mark the rest of your life. All the heavenly angels will be looking at you, working your life towards that direction. However, you yourself must also believe to help the angels work. Some people don't believe in anointing, but I do. The anointing changes a person. What is the difference between Jacob and Esau? Es Esau didn't get the anointing of Abraham and Isaac. He went to Jacob. Just through the laying on of hands, the anointing that was on Abraham, that was on Isaac, came upon Jacob. Esau only got secondary blessings. But the anointing came upon Jacob. And that very night, Jacob had to run away from his brother because his brother was so angry when to kill him. And because of that anointing, downloads start happening. That very night, he, he saw the famous Jacob's ladder in battle. That very night, he began to receive downloads. Now, all the downloads helped him in his life later. He ran to his uncle Laban's place, went to a difficult time, and he served 20 years there. Seven plus seven years plus six years. All together, he served 20 long years before he came back again. But the anointing never left him. The gifts and the anointing of God are without repentance. When God anoints you, He anoints you. However, if you're not faithful, it can be reduced. But it couldn't be taken away. That is why all the northern kings are bad kings. God never took the anointing away. Because once He promised to the ten tribes, then He's going to keep passing the anointing from one guy to another guy. And all the northern kingdom kings are bad. They're all idol worshippers. The southern kingdom, when it split after Solomon's time into Jeroboam and Rehoboam, Rehoboam being Solomon's son, in the southern kingdom, some are good, some are bad. But in the northern kingdom, all are bad. 
But the fact is, it continued for some time because God has split the anointing and given anointing. It was not just a political decision. It was Almighty God raising kingdoms, tearing kingdoms, bringing things up, tearing things down. If God decides from heaven for ten nations to become one nation, it will be so. It's all determined by God and God distributed it by the anointing. So David received an anointing and that anointing started bringing him nearer and nearer the king. The first thing actually that happened was he became a musician to serve the king. He's quite close to the king. It's the anointing that opened the doors. The anointing that keep pushing, pushing him near, near the royalty. And that anointing in the end brought him in this case here to slay Goliath. It's that anointing. And that anointing is what made him extra brave. He killed a lion and a bat. Which means killing Goliath was another story for him, another addition. And in the end, after this slaying of Goliath, David's path looked like a simple road. It looks like the way is open for him because everything is going in his favor after he killed Goliath. You see in chapter 18, you know, his best friend was the king's son. The king's daughter fell in love with him. He was to inherit the kingdom. If all things go well, Saul died. He fall on Jonathan, Jonathan surrender and abdicate, give it to David. David will still be king. See, there could have been another story, if not for the jealousy of King Saul. But King Saul became angry and didn't like David because he had an evil spirit who troubled him and he also have anger issues. People with anger issues always become the opposition to the work of God. Even in the New Testament, when Paul began to preach the word of God, his opponents have anger issues. The Jews were upset at him. The Jews were angry at him. They have angry, anger issues. And so saw I, David, from that day. Well, the story goes that in the end, it was the devil who began to inspire Saul and say, one day I'm going to kill David. One day he's going to do that. But David escaped his presence twice. Because uh, in verse 10, one day David was playing music for Saul. Explain, soothing him. And then Saul suddenly threw an arrow at him. Uh, threw a spear at him. And he missed David two times. Imagine you're a musician playing for a madman who anytime can kill you. How to concentrate on your singing. And that's why I always ask people. Before you attack anybody, Ask yourself, what did that person do to you? Like for example, no, if people say bad about, you know, let's say Mohan or all those things, they say, what has Mohan done to me? Between he and me, he has not done anything to me. What you say is what you say. I might believe or might not believe. But personally, one to one, he has not done anything to me. And then if Mohan, you know, uh, uh, does different things that, that might, I might not understand, I might not agree with him. But one-on-one -on -one in relationship, he has never harmed me, never do anything. Why should I make him my enemy? Correct? And a lot of people, they are throwing spears when people are just playing music to them. People are trying to do good things to them. And they throw spear at you. Because they don't like you, jealous of you, angry at you, angry at your differences, angry at your lifestyle, angry at, you know, uh, different things. And here's the difference. If you 
think that somebody stumble you, then maybe you are the one need to check yourself also. You can be upset at another person for things that they never actually do to you. Isn't that strange? I mean, it's not like somebody punch you and then you don't like them. Somebody slap you and don't like them. But a lot of people are throwing spears when people are trying to be nice to them, trying to cure them, heal them, play music to them. So here's David on the receiving end. Twice it happened, and I think David gave up. I think he gave up playing for him after that. And he avoided the fees, he avoided all those things. He got married to Michal. And um, in the end, Saul became more and more mad. Until chapter 19, you can see the title, Saul persecutes David. Now remember, David was anointed to be king. There's nothing that can stop him being king. But it's a long, long road to become a king. It looked like an easy road at first. Because like the Israelites, I will bring you to a land of milk and honey. Milk and honey. Milk and honey. Go to the promised land looking for milk and honey. And yes, they said it's a land of milk and honey. But God never told us about the giants. God never told you about the difficulties, the trials. Of course He doesn't tell you. He expects that you understand that good things don't necessarily come easy. Big things don't, don't just come easily. What do you think, you know, why do people keep thinking that this move is going to be easy? Oh, we're going to just grow a few arms and legs and everybody believe. These are amateurs at work. Remember, when Moses himself performed signs, people still didn't believe in him. So when God starts doing signs and wonders in our midst, remember some people will still not believe. And that is why I always say, when God does signs and wonders, the signs and wonders always are to confirm the word and not for signs and wonders for their own sake. That is why there are a lot of false signs and wonders that the devil will try to do, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, but they have no doctrine. The first thing you always ask of any ministry, what do they believe and what is their doctrine? Remember how people want to be healed by Jesus, they press him, and then Jesus took a boat to the sea and teach from the boat? Because he want them to hear the word and not just be healed. And remember Mark 16, it says, they shall, you know, preach the word and signs will follow. See the word? Follow. So if the signs follow the word, that is the proper order. Instead, people want signs and then they look, there's no word. Just believe the signs. No. <coughs> the signs every time show a teaching. When Jesus healed the blind man, he says, I am the light of the world. <coughs> when Jesus raised the dead man, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Haven't you noticed that? His signs and wonders are to confirm something he declared. Not just doing it for the sake of performance. And remember, we learned on Thursday night, Jesus healed and raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He asked Jairus, don't let anybody know. So did Jesus do signs and wonders to attract crowd, to attract attention? No. He did it because of his love. He, he, he saw the love Jairus had for the daughter, only daughter, and he healed. Raised her. Remember he also raised another man from the dead. Also in the Gospel of Luke, he interrupted a funeral service because that was the widow's only son. Jesus doesn't do signs and wonders to get the crowds to get attention. 
He do signs and wonders because he loved the people who were suffering under sickness or death. And he wanted to bring joy to the family or to the loved one. So if anyone do signs and wonders only to gain attention, or your motive is to gain crowds and attention, your motive is really wrong. Blessed be the day when we understand we have the power of God, and you quietly go about, heal the sick, remove cancers, pray, and have extraordinary miracles, and then you don't go and tell anyone. You just let the people be loved and blessed by God. It is important for us to understand that. Anyway, here is David. And the persecution of David got worse and worse. It got even more dangerous. And um, again, you see the evil spirit. Remember I said Saul has an evil spirit? While well, David has a Holy Spirit. Evil spirit with people and Holy Spirit with people can never be together. Can never. But... You normal human being, okay. But human being who open the evil spirit can never be with someone who's anointed. Because the anointing means the Holy Spirit is with them. And the two will become enemies. Because Saul had an evil spirit. He was not possessed. He was listening to the evil spirit all the time. All the wrong thoughts, wrong emotions stirred up in him. And he got anger issues. Remember the plastic tree modus operandi is using anger and so again he says Saul sought to pin David to the wall he slipped away from Saul's presence and this time David escaped by night he said cannot cannot stand it anymore and this time verse 11 Saul sent messengers to kill him in the house or so spear not enough now he sent assassination team and uh, so he has to escape. So he ran. Uh, when the assassination uh, team came, he, David fled. He ran away. And uh, then God protected David because David went, went to, to look for, for, for Samuel for protection. And uh, wait. Oh, how did he go to Exodus? Okay. Let's get back. Oh, let's. Okay. No, not this one. Okay, there is it. And, um, but Jonathan was loyal and uh, see, I show one part here. Jonathan knew that he was anointed to be king. When they saw, uh, make a covenant with one another, Jonathan, because he, he, he's a best friend of David, and um, the, the two make a covenant and he says, by no means in verse 2 you shall not die. And then uh, he says to him, uh, even from the future, he says, um, after they have a secret thing, uh, they make a covenant with one another. Oh, if only he knew that he's going to die too. But he did not know. But anyway, David knew he was... Um, going to be a king. Now Jonathan also began to get the persecution from Saul. And um, it says, Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be killed? Because Saul throws spears at him, sent assassins to him, and Jonathan says, why, why must you kill David? And then the father also threw the spear at the son. Uh, and then Jonathan knew. No way you can talk anymore. In fact, um, you can see, remember I say Saul was a very bad guy. Look, he addressed him. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. He had no respect even for his own wife. And um, school her in all those things. And uh, although John Eden was the one defending David, and... Um, so they cried, they wept, and, and they say goodbye. Then David ran to the priest, and then he got a story of David and the priest. Even that is a prophetic act that later Jesus talked about. 
And here's David. He ended up in a cave. He was anointed to be king, but he ended up in a cave. Only God could have planned that kind of journey. So if, if you were one of the followers of David, who believe in his anointing, wouldn't you feel very strange? Hey, we're anointed to be king, we should be there. Why are we here? Because it was not timing yet. Now, David had patience to a certain extent that he never wanted to kill Saul. He had two opportunities to kill Saul, and he never took it because let him die, he says, by, his, by the Lord's hand. He's not going to die. If David kills Saul, who else will rule him, of course? David could have made the whole process faster. But David said, if he died, let him die by his own hand, not going to be by my hand. So, David never took that. But here's David. And uh, then David was obedient. Look, the prophet get told him, do not stay in the stronghold, depart, go to the land of Judah. So he got to run from one place to another one place. That's very tiring being chased. Here you are supposed to be a king, you end up a fugitive. A fugitive is one who has to keep running away because the official king is after you, after your head. So you've got to run from one place to another. Look at the amount of patience that is there, needed. Now he has some level of patience, but David reached a point uh, he saved a city, you know, he kept doing good works and then um, he did a few good things and he spared Saul's life in verse 24, first time. And King Saul took 3,000 chosen men. These are the best fighters chasing after David and 400 men. Look, even numbers cannot match. But. It is important that David continue to wait on the Lord. And David's own men want to kill King Saul. But David stopped them. Good man. Very patient man. So he showed patience up to this time. And um, then again, he tell the problem with Saul. He said, actually David honestly never went after Saul. All his life, he never went to kill Saul. He never did bad things to Saul. All the time, he's always a good guy. But you know what's the problem with Saul? The same problem with many people. Why do you listen to the words of other people? You know, Saul was listening to the wrong people. How do you tell truth? Isn't one of the ways to discover truth is to talk to the person themselves. Correct? You have to hear anything about Mohan, I don't have to ask A, B, C to Z. I just go to Mohan and say, Mohan, what's your story? Correct? There's a way to tell truth. Has Saul ever come to David and say, okay, let's sit, tell me, are you trying to kill me? See, the problem with Saul is he listened to other people but never listened to David. So David many times had to shout and say, when he got a chance to kill Saul, he said, why are you listening to all these people? He says, look, if I'm to kill you, you'll be dead now. And, um, and one thing about David, he recognized the anointing on others. You, can you see that? He said, God anointed you to be king, so that your anointing finish, I won't be the one to kill you. And he called him father because he was the father-in-law. Moreover, my father, see, can you see this rope I cut? This show I could kill you, but I didn't kill you. And uh, there's neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I'm not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me. Let the Lord avenge me on you. My hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, he quote a proverb, 
Wickedness proceeds from the wicked. Remember, a good tree will bear good fruit. And, but my hand will not be against you. I will not do evil against you. So when David finished speaking, when David finished speaking, King Saul said, Is that your voice, my son, David? So he got back a bit to his normal self. And then Saul cried. Saul cried because David, he says, you're more righteous than I am. I done harm to you, you're not done harm to me. And you have rewarded me good while I rewarded you with evil. And a lot of people reward good for evil. But good people, even evil, they reward with good. Like Jesus says. And um, then swear to me that you will not come after me or my descendants to destroy my name. So David saw. I mean he should be happy with that. In between Samuel died. Now here is the little bit where David lose patience with people. He's been running for a while. And there was this story of, um, of um, this guy, a very rich man. His name is Nabal. But he got a very nice understanding wife. So this man looked down on David and David just said, you know, we've been looking after your people indirectly. You know, how about some presents for the young people? And then Nabal is very rude to him. And instead of giving a nice reply, he says, who is David? There are many servants nowadays who break away each from his master because David in the top news was always running away from King Saul but nobody know the true story nobody might know the true story that actually he he was he being thrown spear at uh, assassin sent after him and uh, nobody might know that story but he is running and this Nabal you know say something nasty and then when David's men came they were insulted David said Everyone take your sword. They were going to go for to kill him. Abigail, who was this bad person's wife, says, trouble, we will, the whole, everybody will die. Because in those days, that's what happened. And um, then Abigail made haste, and she got all the presents, and then she said one thing to David. Look at what Abigail said. He says, Oh, on me, my Lord, let me, let this iniquity be. Let your maidservant speak. I mean, here's all this army of 400 tough people who have been battle hardened. And they're all on their way to slaughter. And this little tiny little woman knelt down and she said, Please do not regard this Godro. And that's really a bad guy that she married to. His name so is Nabal, which is like folly or foolishness. And look at what she said. She said that do not avenge yourself with your own hand. Now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for you be as him. But these are the present. So he give him all the present. And then he says, verse 30, It shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel. Look at that. There are many people who know that he will be king. Correct? This is a common news to a farmer out there in the wilderness. A lot of people have spread. That's why the women were singing, David killed his 10,000. They knew he was anointed to be king, but they are, many are not recognizing him. There are few people here and there, like this woman. But her reminder is this. One day when you become king, you might regret what you do now. 
So live like you will become king. And don't do this. One woman stopped. She's slight impatience. Because, I mean, he's been chased so long, and he needs food, clothing, and shelter, and he's going to kill someone. But he was reminded that one day he'll be king. And there are people who believe that. But it shows that God is merciful to David when he was showing a bit of impatience now. Because it looks like he will never become king. Can you see that? If you stop, pause the button at that time, it looks like he will never become king. It will never happen. It looks naturally impossible. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. When God anoints you, God does not make mistakes. Are you saying God made mistakes when he anointed David? No. God knows whom he chooses, whom he calls. Have confidence in the word of God for your life. If God anoints you for something, you must have confidence in that too. But I want to show David's impatience. David's impatience is more with the timing. It's taking a long, long time. It looks hopeless. Moses' impatience is more that he didn't understand how God works. He didn't understand the next step. And he got discouraged the first time. But then he learned patience. Now David his patience was slowly running out and in the end he blessed Abigail and he did exactly that and he, he, he never later when the husband died he proposed to her and um, then chapter 26 he spared Saul a second time this time he took the spear and Again, he says the same thing. And uh, <clears throat> then Saul says, I have sinned, return my son David, I will harm you no more. But he cannot trust this man's words. So David says, send someone to take your spear. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And so David went his way. But here is where chapter 27, verse 1. It's a story of David losing patience. Every man of God has a learned patience. Remember, every, every revival, every man or woman of God, every revolution, Every reformation, every restoration has its story. That's what makes it interesting. The main thing to move from point A to B, point A to B for Moses is different from point A to B for David. So each person's point A to B is a different story. In between, when life is hard, you got to look for food, clothing, and shelter still. So you survive. Like David, you've got to survive the wilderness still. He has to take care of food, clothing, each other for himself and 400 men. It's a big task. But he pulled through. Because God was still with him. I hear when the second time that he has a chance to kill Saul, he didn't take it. Chapter 27, verse 1. David says, Now I shall perish someday. <laughs> Look, when he said that, it doesn't that sound like Moses saying, why you trouble me? He told the Lord. When David said that, he didn't believe that his anointing will make him become king. Because if the anointing protects you, then you cannot say that. You can only keep saying, one day I'll be king. But instead he said, one day I will die. 
without becoming king because King Saul is the one he thinks will kill him. Then he got no chance to become king. Can you see that David has lost his patience? And there's a very important clue there. You will only lose your patience if you lose your faith in the word that God spoke about you. You lose your patience because you do not believe in God's word anymore. And that's the reason you don't have patience. The word patience is the word hupomone. The other word, makrotumia, which translated patience, in my translation, I don't translate patience anymore. I translate it as long suffering. The only word for patience in the New Testament, Logos King James, is the word hupomone. The other word is the word long suffering. Long suffering is suffering long. But the word patience is hupomone. Romanized as H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E Based on the word mone, which is from the word meno, M-E-N-O Which means to abide Jesus said, abide in me and let my words abide in you Remain in me And hupo is strengthening the mone, which means it's many multiplication of abiding so the only way you can have patience is you believe in the anointing God gave you. You believe in the rhema God spoke to you. You believe in the word God spoke to you. As long as you still believe, you will have patience. But the day that you stop believing the word because you look, you, you're walking on water, you're looking at the circumstances. How can the two come together? You cannot. You either look at God's word, which is possible, rather than look at the mountain, which tells you it's impossible. Patience is the ability to keep believing, no matter what the circumstances. So all you need is that patience. You know it's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. You're going to keep encouraging yourself in the Lord. So David says, and he started taking the wrong action. He says, I shall perish someday by the hand of King Saul. Of course that should not happen, will not happen. So it's n nothing better for me than I go to the land of the Philistine. By that time he got 600 people. So he arose and went to Akish the Philistine. And then Akish gave him Ziklag. The place to dwell in. It's like the border between Israel and the Philistines. And that's why Ziklag continued to belong to the kings of Judah because of that agreement. But you all know what happened at Ziklag. At Ziklag, David and his mighty men reached the lowest point. Remember when they were out in battle, somebody took all their things and wives and children. And the people were so heartened that they cried an entire day. Grown men cried. And they would cry so much that they were so upset and angry they wanted to kill David for letting that happen. Do you know that in the perfect will of God there will be no zigzag? Because in vision we saw that when David left Israel and went into the Philistine territory, David always had three mighty generals following him. The three mighty generals stopped at the border and never crossed. They were waiting for David to come, come back. Other angels will be David, more of the angels of like Revelation, but the mighty warring angels, they could not follow him because he was outside God's will. Only when David got back into the territory of Israel was he in the perfect will of God. What are we learning here? Patience has to be learned and mastered by every man of God. And if you have your own calling in God, under COG, you will have, because COG is big, and you have your own little ministry under it. 
you will need to learn to be patient. Learn to master patience. Without mastering patience, you cannot prevail. It's prevailing prayer. Moses must learn patience. Imagine if Moses got discouraged and left everything, you won't have Moses. Same with David. He, he left the land of Israel, went into Ziklag. And so the time that David joined the country of the Philistine was one full year and four months. It was seven. Do you know how near he was to becoming king? One year and four months. So he lasted so long. He lasted so long. But just one year and four more months more. He already tahan, 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 tahan. So you think, one year and four more months of misery in the wilderness. He would not have the story of Ziklag. Ziklag was just the mercy of God. It should never have happened. David ran out of patience. Every man and woman of God must learn to be patient. If you run out of patience, get ready for your own zigzag. You will suffer loss. You will suffer grief. You will suffer pain, which without God, you will never recover. Some people never recover. Zigzag is a story of patience running out. Do not have that. It's no necessity for the kings of Judah to have Ziklag. Because Ziklag belongs to the Philistines. That one tiny little town is not worth it. He was given the whole town to live. I thought he got 600 men. Like it's like a little village in a corner of Philistine. But it's an unnecessary burden. And then David had to live a lie. Because when he went and raided different things, he had to lie to the Philistines that he raided against people of Judah. So from losing patience, he got to live a lie to the Philistines. Not good. Not good at all. And just to show you where he tell a lie. Because the, the king Ashish will ask him, David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to God. You know, when he go to any place to raid and kill, he must kill totally so that no one can report to King Akish that David was killing people under Philistine authority. You don't want that. He didn't believe that his anointing would see him through. And now he ended up living a lie in front of the Philistine. It's not a good life to live. And so the rest of the story of Ziklag is a story of the suffering that will come when you lose your patience. Sometimes you thought, I better make my life a bit more comfortable. Let me go to the Philistines for food, clothing and shelter. But you're worse off than you're in the wilderness. Because you guess, guess what? They lost, actually they lost everything together. Everything was taken. If not for the mercy of God, they would never got it back. They lost more than they could gather. It's not worth it. It's better to suffer in the wilderness but be in the perfect will of God than to live a life of a lie and the facilities, food, clothing and shelter under the Philistines. It's not worth it. So be patient. Do the will of God and God will bring you through. The anointing will make room for you. The gifts of God 
or make room for you. And uh, <clears throat> with David, what was a problem? Typing issue. It takes so long, so much hardship that he literally gave up. Only by the mercy of God, he still loved the Lord. That's what kept him. Do you know the only thing that kept him? I show you. Right at the end of um, uh, this chapter 30, the only thing that he survived on in chapter 30 verse 1, there is Ziglag. Ziglag got destroyed. Everyone taken. Verse 4. David and the people who he lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. They really cried. Then he sought the Lord and uh, as to what to do. But before that happened, when they wept, verse 6, David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people were grief, was grief, every man for his own sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. The only thing that kept him is he still loved the Lord. He gave up becoming a king. He actually gave up becoming a king. No one anymore. But he still loved God. That was the only mercy that kept him. If not for that, he would never be able to get back. He still loved God. That's how he could strengthen himself in the Lord. Because when you lose everything, most people give up God, correct? Look at Job. He lost everything. He never gave up God. But Mrs. Job gave up already. It's easy to say you love God when you got everything. But not easy to say you love God when you lose everything. Literally at that point. Remember, we read the story, we know the ending, we all don't suffer so much. But if you're in the middle of that, you do not know whether you will get everything back. You're not sure what the future is like. You just lost everything. The only thing you do not lose is, you still love God. Somewhere inside his heart. And because of his love for the Lord, that is where he never gave up. He turned it around. By the mercy of God. <laughs> and then he still could hear God. And the Lord gave him instruction. So that's the story. And I go to the New Testament. The New Testament is a story of Paul who was Saul. He has to learn a different type of patience. Saul, when he was born again, you can see something about him. In Acts 9, after he was born again, and then after a sting in, uh, oh, this is Acts 15, Acts 9, I should go to Acts 9. After he was born again, Bible tells us in verse 20, immediately he preached Christ. And everyone was amazed in verse 22, but in verse 23, after many days, the Jews plotted to kill him. See, Paul was eager to preach Christ. And Paul has to be let down in verse 25 in a basket. And then there's a gap of three years between verse 25 and 26 when he went to Arabia. Then he came back after three years in verse 26 to Jerusalem. In verse uh, 29, they were still attempts to kill him. Now Saul knew he was anointed and called to the ministry because he always quoted the, the Damascus Road experience. That was when Jesus spoke to him about his calling. He was born again and called at the same time. In the end, in verse 30, he was sent to 
hometown Tarsus. He was Saul of Tarsus. So he was waiting and waiting and waiting there. At first, he like David got patience. 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 Then you see in Acts chapter 11, it was Barnabas who opened a door for him to Antioch. Because Barnabas went and saw the work of God in Antioch. And in verse 25, Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek for Saul. Opened the door for ministry and brought him in. So Saul remained in Antioch. And he just was faithful there in the church. Then in Acts 13, you see them called to the ministry, first missionary journey. Then in Acts 14, they came back. Acts 15 was the Jerusalem Council about the Gentile question. And Saul was not a compromiser. He was a man of principle. That's his strong point. That's a good, good point about Paul. He wanted the doctrine to be perfect. After the Jerusalem Council, everyone agreed that God was with the Gentiles. The Gentiles don't have to become Jews to be, remain Christian. So they wrote letters in verse 23, 24 and everything else. So when they got back to Antioch, in verse 30, they delivered a letter there and everyone was happy. Gentiles don't have to become Jews. They can remain Christians by themselves. And um, then, in verse 34, 35, Paul and Barnabas remain in Antioch teaching preaching the word. Verse 36, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren. And that was when Barnabas and Saul quarrel about Mark. It says in verse 39, Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Who is wrong? Who is right? And then to God, and up two missionary teams instead of one. But the quarrel was because Paul was impatient with Mark. Paul's impatience is with people. Moses' impatience was with God's timing and methods. He did not know what God was going to do. So he reacted. But he only reacted one time at the beginning. He was quite a patient man. David's impatience was hardship and timing. It was hard to wait through the time. Saul's impatience is with people. You know, Saul is not a patient man. So, he, he cannot stand Mark. But later on, you see in 2 Timothy, he say, Mark is of benefit to me. Without Barnabas, uh, I think Mark is gone. When you got rejected by a man like Paul, you got no way back. So here is where Paul's impatience come out. I need to show the weakness of these men of God so that we know patience got many levels. You must be patient because of timing. God's timing is not our timing. You must be patient when God never revealed to you the next step. You only reveal one step. And when you don't know the other step, you don't know how long it's going to take. The only thing you know is, as long as God's with me, it's fine. And you must be patient even when it's very difficult to be in a waiting period in the wilderness. But more than that, learning patience is also learning to be patient with other people who might take a longer time to become useful. So, I mean, it's not a, to us, it's not a big issue. John Mark following, you know, he said, ah, okay, yeah, you know, you take him along, but, but let you be the one who trained him. But Paul completely said, I don't want him in my sight. Oh, that's a strong guy. And uh, you learn that later, I need to show you the words, in uh, Mark, uh, in 2 Timothy 4.11, which is the last episode, he says, 
Get Mark and bring him with you. See, Mark is an important guy. And, uh, but what, what we need to see here is that this is the same Mark who wrote Mark's Gospel. This is the same Mark who wrote Mark's Gospel. At that time, Mark's Gospel was not written yet. It took some time for the Gospel to be written. Mark might be slow. Mark might be discouraged easily. But Mark wrote Mark's Gospel. Mark stayed under Peter's ministry, recorded all the things that are there. He could have recorded more. We don't know at what point Paul allowed him back into his life. Maybe instead of Luke just writing, Luke was the one who wrote Acts, and Luke followed Paul all the time. Because Luke was a very mature physician. So Paul can deal with people like that. But Paul cannot handle this young man, Mark. Impatient. But Mark was an important part in the kingdom of God. If you take Mark's gospel out, we got a big chunk missing. If Barnabas was not there, I don't know whether Mark might have succeeded. Maybe at the beginning of his life, he needed a lot of help. Good thing Barnabas was there. Good thing Barnabas was there. And you can see Paul's impatience and his roughness um, with people, especially with people. Uh, okay, here's where in Galatians, Paul mentioned in uh, Galatians chapter 2, he said, when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. <laughs> Why well, he blamed Peter for uh, being impolite to the, to the Gentile? Because what Peter did is, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. When they came, he withdrew, separated himself, and ate with the Jewish section. And so he said, he's playing the hypocrite. And then when Peter got up, because uh, some of us don't know what Orthodox Jews are like. They're also not easy to get along. Do you know Orthodox Jews cannot use the same table, the same plates? You go to Israel, the normal Jews you see who eat freely with you or fellowship are the more modern Jews. The Orthodox Jew regard Gentiles as unclean. So they cannot eat at the same table with you. They cannot use the same fork, same spoon, same section. It's segregation. Oh, they're not, not necessarily. Reli two religious people. Religious people or two religious are not very friendly. And that was the custom. They do not eat with Gentiles. So, they were, when they went into church, into church is Christian. So they freely mix. Then when a group of visitors who are very, 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 very Jewish visit Peter, excuse him, says, oh, excuse me, I have to go to the Jewish section now. And Barnabas look, and Paul, Paul remained in the Gentile section, because Paul was apostle of the Gentile. He ate with them. Barnabas look at Peter, look at Paul, Look at Peter, look at Paul, now you got to choose. Then he take his plate, go to Peter's side. When Paul saw that, he stood up. He stood up and he scolded them in front of James who just came. This is the character of Paul. Very impatient with people. If you are understanding, you will understand that. You are with apostle to the Gentiles. Peter has to go back to James. So those are religious fellows also. Peter was only there temporarily. 
and he has to go back and live with all these fellas. At that time, at least. Until later on, he went to Rome. Where is Paul? Don't care. And he can be a bit rough with people. That's Paul. Then here is another case where you see that Paul really need patience with um, people. And um, when Paul was on trial in Acts 23, Paul looked up at the council. And Paul said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded and said, Slap him! <laughs> Strike him in the mouth. Punch him in the mouth or slap him. Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall! He's called back. You seek to judge me contrary to the law? Do you command me to be struck also? And then the people said to him, that's the high priest you're scolding. <laughs> and Paul sort of apologized. He says, oh, I didn't know he was a high priest. <laughs> Can you see something about Paul here? He's very rough with humans, rough with people. And uh, Paul is a, is a type who needs a little bit to learn about diplomacy. Do not send him to negotiate peace. <laughs> he will antagonize everybody. And that is his impatience with people that Paul has. That slowly as he grew, by the time he was about to go home to be with the Lord, <laughs> His last letter was 2 Timothy, where he says, I finish the race. I fought a good fight. I'm now ready to go home. By the way, where's Mark? <laughs> I, I mean, do you know that at the end of your life, you will understand that all quarrels are actually meaningless? Correct? Every quarrel you quarrel with every human being is only on this earth. Right? Something to do with the earth. You're, how long you've known them and what they did and what you did on the earth not because of something you did in heaven it's only something to do on earth forgive, forget, live on life goes on don't wait until your last year on earth because <laughs> then you don't understand in the end, here is what happened when, when, when you are young and especially when you are an intellect like Paul when your intellect like Paul, a principle is more important than a person. But you learn that people are as important. I would say the word more. As important as the principle. So you must handle it with great tenderness and mercy. I'll give an example. If you have a robot make decision for you, so the robot is programmed. Let's say everyone who is late for the meeting, the robot stand at the door and give you a whack. You know, 15 minutes late, whack kind of thing. Just it's a silly situation like a robot. But robots can also kill kind of thing. They program the kill. And so, one fine day, you had an accident. And, you know, because of the accident, and you had to help somebody, or you saw some, an accident, and someone was injured. So because of helping them, you were late by half an hour. The robot comes by, give you two wet. He said, why? I, I helped the person. Still late. That's how robots operate. There's no compassion on your, what will happen to you, what is in your past. They don't differentiate. Two people can do the same thing, but for very different reasons. And so robots 
don't know how to administer mercy. Have you noticed every place where authority is given, mercy is also given because of the human factor. I don't think they will ever be smart enough to program a robot with empathy because it's too complex, too many variations. When a principle got so many variations, it's no more principle. But there are variations. Because of variation, even the Bible made a difference between accidental death and purposeful premeditated death. Because the Bible says, if you're using an axe and the axe head flow out from the handle and kill somebody, you got one chance to live. Run to the city of refuge. And when you reach the city of refuge, the avenger, because in the Old Testament it's eye for eye, two for two, so God must got provision for accidental death. So as long as you're inside the city of refuge, the avenger cannot kill you. So you imagine justice is based on how fast you can run. Which doesn't seem to be fair, right? What happened if a person is a slow runner? <laughs> and then they die 10 feet away from the city of refuge. Then the faster runner escaped, the slower runner died. <laughs> or, what about people who really remove the spirit of the law and follow the letter? Like Abner. Because Joab killed his brother Abishai in the battle between the north and southern kingdom. Remember, David was over the south, Amnon was over the north. And Abishai, his brother, died. Joab actually didn't want to kill him. Joab said, hey, go and, go and take somebody else as a prize. But Abishai keep following him, and he threw one spear, and the guy died. From that day onwards, Abner don't like Joab. He's looking to take revenge. He killed my brother, I'm going to kill him back one day. So, when he had opportunity to visit the southern kingdom, he went to the city of Hebron, which was one of the city of refuge, by the way, where David was, and he told Joab, Oh, I got something to talk to you. Let's talk outside the city. So when they stepped outside the city, he killed him. Because <laughs> Joab forgot about the Avenger. He thought he really got something to talk. So he made him go outside the city of refuge, which technically he can take revenge. But all under trickery. He tricked a person to go out. So that is really going by the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. So all these cases tell us something. There are a lot of places where compassion, empathy must be shown. Joab, if you know the real story, he tried to avoid killing Abishai. You read the story. He did his best. And he said, go and chase somebody, else. don't chase me, because he's a big, good fighter and a big general with skill. He tried to avoid killing, because he knows this is Abner's brother, younger brother. So if you know the whole story, you will know that Joab was killing Abishai in war. And then even in the war, he was quite nice about it. He says, don't chase me, I will kill you. I'm better than you. Chase somebody else. So if you know the real story, you would never avenge Joab, correct? No need, no need to avenge Abishai. Because there's a lot of these little stories which is different from when David plotted to kill Uriah. That one was premeditated. And they purposely commanded Joab to withdraw so that, you know, everyone charge! And Uriah charge! Hey, hey, everybody no more! And then he got killed. <laughs> of course, what? One lone ranger charging there. And everybody withdraw. And David was guilty. In principle, 
outwardly a robot will only see that war, war happens, collateral damage. But God say, you are the one who planned it. You're the one who instigate it. You're the one who authorize it. His blood is on your hands. So we have this situation where we need to understand that each human being is different. And it takes skill to be patient with people. And think about this. How many people were given Saul a chance in the church? How many people will give Saul a chance in the church? Do you know who gave him a chance? The same guy who gave chances to John Mark. Do you know that nobody wanted Paul? Nobody wanted him. Nobody wanted him. Don't care how talented he is. How intellectual he is. How clever he is. Nobody wanted him. Only one man wanted him. Barnabas. Thought about the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> when Paul rejected Mark, he should have a closer look at the mirror. That he himself was rejected by everyone except Barnabas. John Mark didn't even have the reputation Paul had. <laughs> Paul was actually worse than Mark. So, at the end of his life, all these things don't matter. It only matter whether you have love for everyone. Think about it. At the end of your life, you're gonna, not going to care whether you know you got 10 managers, 3 don't do well, 4 days. It's their own business between them and God. You give equal opportunity. Okay? Maybe you need more understanding. Take Jesus. Did Jesus appoint people just based on their skill or based on training each person? To Jesus, every job is a training. Every job is a trial and a test. So, Jesus had 12 disciples. The most qualified to handle money was Matthew the tax collector. Don't you think so? He's a qualified accountant in those days, a qualified uh, official collector of money. He had handled books, handled large sums of money. He was the most experienced. Wouldn't he be the one who had the job to be treasurer? And of all of them, All the disciples were very honest, except one guy. The most dishonest and hypocritical of all the disciples was Judas Iscariot. Cannot be trusted. Word cannot be trusted. He, in the Bible or in, in visions we saw, he is very, he's known as the absentee disciple. Always absent under occasion, big occasion, then he show up. I'm close to Jesus, kind of thing. He's really on show, kind of, really performance guy. You know, all, all the important prayer meetings, everything, hard, difficult, long journey, all that, you know. And here, he got this habit, every time go to town, uh, he look for the, the rich people he know. And then he stayed with them. Jesus and his disciples stay in humble quarters, sometimes stay outside. When they stay outside, Judas said, Oh, I've got to visit my friends. Judas never spent outdoors with them. Man. And then for all the hard yaka, hard work, prayer, hard work, this, hard work, he excused himself. 
Then when when it's a place where everyone eyes are open and see like a performance and not like a stage time, then Jesus there, everybody gather the thing, then he will be there very close to Jesus. And very strange. In um, in the Lost Supper, when they were all seated, Judas was a bit late. And you know one reason and, and John was sitting very close to Jesus and then the other disciples. When Judas came, he would squeeze himself between if possible, between John and Jesus. Or between another disciple, Jesus squeezed. Because he wants to be close to Jesus. He only wants it for sure. So that everybody look at Jesus and say, oh, Judas, go close to him. So that he can tell them, yeah, I'm close to him. I negotiate for him. Things that Jesus is even not interested in. He would be the last guy any one of us appoint to be treasurer over money. Correct? If a robot were to put the whole qualification into a computer and print out who is qualified, obviously Matthew will get a job. Why Judas is scared? Because to Jesus, money is not money is important, being a good steward. But it's not the most important thing in the whole world. Because to Jesus, if you have money, he's fine. If you don't have money, he's fine. He's not captive to money. I'm sure when the tax collector came, Judas was not around. <laughs> and it was Judas who say about the woman with the alabaster box. He already calculated. This is worth 300 denarii. Say, shouldn't this be so? And you know, the woman, if you want to give to Jesus, should give it in money form. So it comes into his pocket. 300 denarii. And they try to, try to put it with a nice statement. <coughs> to give to the poor. 300 denarii. He calculated. So what do we think how Jesus handled human being? Jesus handled each human being differently. He purposely gave the treasurer job to Judas so that he has a chance to repent. So that he can prove himself before God. If he can overcome his money problem, He will be a great disciple. Didn't he sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? <laughs> Why do you think he take the 30 pieces of silver? Because he's a money man. Can you see how clever Jesus is? Jesus gave him the best opportunity to better himself. He will either overcome that and change or his old habits will pull him back he has only one chance three years is a short time to train a person so one chance if he had overcome the money problem I can guarantee you he will never sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because he understands that money is not the most important thing in the world to him, money is his God. Everything is measured based on money. He measured Jesus based on 30 money. Then when he realized Jesus, you know, was killed, because he actually wanted to make more profit, or whatever thing, whatever he was thinking. Then when he saw all that Jesus went through, finally his conscience strike, but too late. Too late. And even at the end, he never believed Jesus was the Christ. He only said, I have betrayed an innocent man, not an innocent man of God, not an innocent prophet, not an innocent Messiah. Never said that. He only regarded Jesus as a man, he could take advantage of. Never believe 
that he is the Messiah, Christ, or even the living word of God. So what does that tell us about the way Jesus handled each human being? Jesus has a principle, but his principles are tailored exactly for each person, uniquely. Jesus will never give anyone up because he will give a chance to every single person. Do you know how many chances he gave Judas? The last chance was when the Lord's Supper. There's a time for Judas to turn around. When he said, one of you will betray me. Obviously, Judas is scared. He already behind planning. That was his last chance. And then when the disciples were asking, Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Remember they were asking one another, Are you the one? Are you the betrayer? Imagine, they don't know who the betrayer. And Peter came to John. Hey, John. Yes, don't let the others hear. I know you don't betray. I also don't betray, so we do are okay. But can you check with Jesus? Ask him who's the one. We know our Jesus knows everything. Ask him who's the betrayer. And so John came to Jesus, leaned on his bosom. Ah. <laughs> Say, by the way, Master, you know I will never betray you. I will love you and all that. But Master, who, who's going to betray you? <laughs> and then Jesus got a secret quote. The one whom I'm going to dip the bread in the soup and give to him. Oh, I got a secret quote. <laughs> this is not Da Vinci quote. This is Jesus quote himself. So, only the few of them know when Jesus took, and that is usually like, you know, sometimes they do it, the master would do that to his favorite pupil, like give them some food. You know, like some of you do, you know, when, when we go for dinner, some of you would take food, ah, and it's a polite thing. So they actually give to the person. And the moment he took it, the Bible says in John, the devil came into Judas. That was the end. That was his last chance to become the devil. Oh, his last chance not to become the devil. Oh, Jesus, our Lord Jesus, so merciful, so kind, so compassionate. And you can see that when Jesus was on the cross, dying for the sins of the whole world, taking the evil of the wanted universe being absorbed by him, all the evil of the past, present, and future. Jesus looked down and he saw his physical mother crying. Then he told John, Behold your mother. He told his mother, Behold your son. He still took care of his mother. This is Jesus. In principle, he don't have to do that. He's dying for the whole world. But he still did that. Because Jesus cared and he loved individually. That is something Paul learned from Jesus. That is something why in this revival, now you know why the methods that I use in my ministry, I learn from Jesus himself. And why I have to be extra, extra patient with people, give them the best chance possible, because I know after us, there is no more chance. So we don't want to be the people who are responsible for them going to hell if we too easily reject a person. While at the same time we want to train the best of the best of the best group 
with the highest standard possible. We must have the ability to cater to the weakest. Because sometimes when you cater to the weakest, you ignore those who want more or who can actually go further. So in any church, they must have those who want to go further, here is how far you can go. And there's no limit. Those who are very slow, don't worry. As long as you still love Jesus, as long as you love Jesus, you still got a chance. That is our Lord Jesus. At the end of the day, when we go to heaven, you'll be happy you take that road. You'll be happy you take that road. Because when you go to heaven, you realize, John, John Mark nearly never wrote the gospel. If he, got, if he had taken another road. And without Barnabas' help, Paul would not have been who he was. Sometimes your life revolves around your relationship with one person. But it's a very important person. And the very person relationship whom you need for your next open door, you reject it. Finish. Habis. Kaput. The only reason Joseph was free from prison was because he was kind to the butler. He noticed how sad they were. Think about it, they are two different persons. I'm a man of principle. My job is to give you all food. Don't talk to me, I'm not interested in your story. Joseph will, will be, the rest of his life will be in prison. You know how Joseph came out from prison? He not only distributed food, take care of the prisoners, one day he saw new prisoners, two, the, bucket, the baker and the butler. And then he noticed they were very, very sad. I mean, they were more sad the next day than the day before because they both got drink. See, after their drink, they became more sad. So he noticed. It was not his business to talk to every prisoner. You talk to every prisoner, where got time? But these two prisoners are new. He knew what it was like to be rejected. He knew what it was like to be a slave. He knew what it was like to cry and nobody wipe your tears for you. So he looked at these two sad people, maybe new prisoners, sad. And he said, why are you both so sad? And then they both tell him the dream. And he interpret both dreams. What the story never showed was, after he interpreted the dream, the butler got a nice smile. The baker was even more sad. <laughs> got three more days, he died. So, Joseph's Freedom depended on the skill of his relationship abilities. His emotional IQ, his motion, emotional quotient EQ, his ability to read people's emotions was important key to his freedom. Without that, he will never have a chance to interpret Pharaoh's dream. So you never know the relationships you form with people. Paul was where he was because of one person, Barnabas. My advice, don't just look for people and try to pull strings or do the wrong thing. Be nice to everyone. Be nice to everyone. You don't have to make yourself the enemy of everyone. If you want to leave a place, leave nicely. If you want to say goodbye, say goodbye nicely. Don't purposefully make enemies of people because one day you will need them. And here's the thing. If the word of God on this move is what the word of God is, And in the next seven times seven years, 
this end time move will be the most important. Even if there's a small chance of that happening in people's eyes, to us it's 1,000% happening. But in people's eyes, even a small chance of that happening, shouldn't they treat everyone nicely? Because one day, you will need us to spare you the famine. The very person that they tried to kill, the brothers of Joseph, was the very person who actually saved their whole family. If Joseph had died, all of them would have died in a famine. I say again, you don't know who will be your saviour in times of need. You never know who. And I have some interesting stories on that. When I was fresh in the ministry, I came out from the Baptist seminary. And all we had was a little prayer group, and then we started an independent ministry called Alleluia Ministries, which will try to train five-fold ministries. So uh, I rented a little place outside the church there in Penang Reservoir Gardens, and uh, I stayed downstairs, and there was a room I rented, and uh, the landlady was upstairs, and we all did her other children. Uh, and so the downstairs we used for prayer and all those things. And there was... Uh, one of the uh, sisters who work in a like a kindergarten teacher so because I live by faith once in a while I notice that you know money dropped from the window I notice that hey got money here so one day I said okay that's interesting I know cannot be just angel drop money you know I know uh, cr crow uh, of course God if God can get the the, the crows to send meat, he can also get the crows to bring money for you. <laughs> Go with that one. But uh, then I said, okay, uh, i observe next time, roughly when. Then one fine day, I saw the money drop. Then I quickly ran to the window to peep who dropped. And it was this Sunday school teacher. She was always faithful, every month giving something in faith. And uh, so I said, praise the Lord, the Lord bless her. Then through time, my ministry grew. And then when I have to leave Penang for Kuala Lumpur and all those other places, and by that time she had grown in the Lord and she had grown in the ministry, she had grown in ability. And guess what? It was me who helped her next. Because I opened for door for her to be in the ministry and today she's still a pastor of a church in Penang. So you never know who you help. The person you help might be the person who help you next time. Cast your bread upon the water. Be kind to everyone. Because one day it will, come, it will come back to you. Keep doing good deeds and be good to people. Relationships are important. Because when some of the doors are slammed wrongly, the door is closed permanently. And if this move is where this move is going, it is very important for us on our side to be unjudgmental, merciful, kind, loving, patient, because in the end, if this is the final move, after us, there's no more chance. Correct. They can go to 1,000 churches, but finally they end up in our place. If they don't succeed here, maybe they have a certain problem. If we cannot make it help them, after us there's no more. If this is the final move in the final place. That's why we have to be extra patient, extra loving and the type of leadership we have. We still need to understand there's a strong part of us that need to be there. But we need to be balanced in both sides. To those who love the discipline and love to press on that, we have facilities for that. To produce the most disciplined spiritual SAS forces. But to those who are slow in every area, we must cater for them, to the weak and to the strong. That was Paul's weakness. By the time people come to him, people need to be very strong. 
the weak might not survive. It's okay because he's the beginning of the move. But we are the end time of the move, where we are supposed to save the strong, the weak, and the in-between. Save everyone. So we must have the capacity of patience with people. So as I conclude, the reason why you cannot move from point A to point B is lack of patience. Lack of patience because you're impatient with God's methods. God does things outside and God's methods and timing. Or you're impatient because of His timing and hardship. Or you're impatient because of the people. And surprise, surprise, some of the people that God sent to you could be the people for you to learn to mold yourself in your personality so that you can become the gifted person God wants you to be. God might actually make you live through that kind of situation as part of your training. So it's important for us to understand patience is the key to prevailing prayer, prevailing praise and worship. So as we enter into an unusual night tonight, <laughs> where we had all the sharings, all the prayer, we are going to just soften the lights, uh, and then towards, um, uh, I'm going to play by ear here, uh, perhaps some of you might have to keep your sharing to the next Friday all night, because we want to spend quality time prayer, and one hour just make it, so we push one and a half hour, it just make it with extra. So guess what, the night is almost over. It's now 4.07. You have one and a half hours to pray in the Spirit. Please, I beseech you, push your best so that you don't have the Lord Jesus coming to you and say, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? So let this one hour count because of the presence that the Lord has put in this place. And so let's soften the lights and just pray and pray through to 5.30 and then we'll gather for some special thing.